Okay, awesome. Well, <laughs> then without further ado, I will get our events started for today. So welcome everyone to uh, the second day of our Obliquity Medical Humanities Collective. Uh, this is the beginning of the history component of our conference. So the history component will be the, the morning of today, and then we will transition over to presence. So kicking things off today are Dr. Pamela Brett McLean and uh, Dr. Jacques Murray, and they are going to talk to us about the history of the medical humanities in Canada, reflecting back and looking forward. So I'm just going to do some quick introductions. So Dr. Brett McLean, as co-founder and director of the Arts and Humanities in Health and Medicine program at the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the U of A, her work concentrates on innovative teaching and learning approaches to foster humanism and professionalism in the health professions. She it has received the Canadian Association for Health Humanities Award of Achievement for her contributions to developing the field of health humanities in Canada and is a past co-recipient of the Taos Institute Outstanding Contribution Award. Dr. Jacques Murray, Professor Emirata at Dalhousie University, an internationally recognized multiple sclerosis expert. He was Dalhousie's eighth Dean of Medicine. Founding Dalhousie's Medical Humanities Program in 1992 is recognized as one of, of, one of his most lasting accomplishments as Dean. Concerned about educating and treating the whole person, his vision for medicine continues to provide a guiding light for medicine and health. Dr. Murray is a member of the Order of Canada and the Order of Nova Scotia, and is also an inductee into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. So with that, I will pass things over to Dr. Brett McLean to get things started. Thank you so very much, Venetia. Um, so good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to be here. Um, I have been so looking forward to this opportunity. Um, it's wonderful. It's just an incredible moment to share with Dr. Jock Murray, and he will learn more, as you will, about some of the ways that the Medical Humanities Program at Dalhousie and his efforts helped to inspire and also helped in many ways uh, significant ways contributed to the introduction of our arts and humanities and health and medicine or medical humanities program here at the University of Alberta. So it is a, it's just wonderful to have an opportunity to share a bit about that story. Um, it's wonderful to be here, uh, particularly because it's Obliquity's first medical humanities collective gathering. Um, it has been incredible to watch Dr. Venetia Baradia, uh, who as a few years ago, as a medical student, had a vision for bringing arts, humanities, medicine, and sciences all together, along with the larger community, the community here within the university, but also within our larger uh, community um, beyond the university, because we are all together in the enterprise and our concerns around helping to heal medicine and helping to create better futures for healthcare. Um, I have long imagined a medical humanities meeting here at the University of Alberta. Um, and so this is triply uh, wonderful and exciting in a special moment. I think that this signals growing recognition of the importance of the medical health humanities across Canada and also uh, points to all that can be achieved through partnership and creative uh, collaborative efforts. It's so exciting that this is not only the University of Alberta, but this is a partnership with Western University and the team includes both students and residents here and also at Western University. So congratulations team Obliquity and um, and really, really excited about the wonderful program that you put together today and learning more. Uh, We'll continue on. I'm just going to take a look. Oh, I think this is where I need to learn how to do a number of things all together. So just click down here. 
there. That that so this this is those were some words of welcome uh, for this slide, and then I'll just uh, move here. This is uh, Dalhousie University, so Charles Tupper Building, and you can see um, a photo as well of Dr. Jock Murray, who Manisha described as. Um, found having founded the first medical humanities program in Canada, and that was in 1992. Uh, it had been a long, there, there had been many years that I'd been working very happily as a research associate in medicine and medical faculties across Canada, but there was somehow, there was a yearning to do more. There was a yearning within me to somehow be connected to something like the medical humanities program, uh, the medical humanities program that had been founded at Dalhousie. And I can recall decades ago, going to Dalhousie University, um, beginning, just beginning to do doctoral studies, interdisciplinary doctoral studies in arts and health, and imagining perhaps one day there might be more than just one program, and perhaps I could connect, be connected with it, help contribute to it, et cetera. And because uh, my husband's family lives in Nova Scotia, we often found ourselves in Halifax, and I would walk the halls of the Sir Charles Tupper building, and I would look at the door with the name plate for the program so that I could really appreciate this was real, and it just helped to continue to inspire uh, my imaginings. It took some time before that actually happened. Uh, but that's, this is still, so in part you might, oh, sorry, let's see if I can do this. Um, is that good? Okay. So in part, this is the home of the first medical humanities program in Canada. It is one of the, I don't know whether birthplaces or where the idea was conceived for the arts, humanities and health medicine program here. It's also the birthplace of the Canadian Association for Health Humanities. So this is a very, very special place. Uh, and you'll see Dr. Wendy Stewart, who is now program director of, uh, uh, of the program at Dalhousie is also presenting this weekend at the symposium. And I wanted to recognize her uh, and her wonderful contributions to the medical, medical humanities in Canada and uh, a wonderful colleague. So this is um, a special theme that Academic Medicine published in 1993, and it featured hundreds, uh, I think hundreds of uh, program descriptions, the large majority of which were in the United States. And this is a theme that I will reconnect with a little bit later in the talk. Um, but the Medical Humanities Program at Dalhousie was certainly featured, as were two other uh, initiatives, one at Memorial and one at the University of Manitoba. Now it's unclear how, uh, where the presence is of those. I think they've evolved in some ways, but the uh, Medical Humanities Program at Dalhousie has certainly continued on as have another, a number of other Medical Humanities programs been introduced uh, in an enduring fashion in uh, Canadian medical schools. Just as medical humanities have been growing in Canada, um, they have been growing internationally. There is an uh, there is ongoing global expansion of medical humanities, also known as health humanities at this point, uh, around the world. Much of this is evolving in relation to uh, concern for increasing technicalization of medicine, uh, a concern that that is undermining uh, the doctor-patient relationship, compassion, and care. As, um, as part of the patient's experience. Um, you'll see here that the first uh, organization that was introduced was in 1998 in the United States. That was followed by another uh, organization in the United Kingdom in 2002 and on and on. In 2018, the Canadian Association for Health Humanities was introduced. And again, this these, these structures uh, continue to expand. Um, here, I just want to give, uh, in terms of history, um, when you're thinking about history, you want to think about chronological sort of thinking. And he, this is a bit of a timeline of world history. This is available at useful, 
as useful charts. Uh, I forget the fellow's name who does this, but he also has a YouTube video out. And it's really quite a wonderful, concise, um, well, widely abbreviated uh, uh, overview of world history, but one that recognizes historical movements across different regions of the world all at the same time, which I find very, very interesting. Um, when you're thinking about history and historical scholarship, you want to also think about significance. And I think it is significant that medical humanities programs are being introduced in medical education and that there's been a struggle for that. And that's part of what you'll hear about today. Um, in relation to historical analysis and interpretation or scholarship, uh, this is sometimes called historiography. Uh, and that is, there is just so, there are so many stories out there and so many perspectives. And so, there's not one accounting of these stories. It depends on the perspective, one's perspective, one's uh, location in time. Uh, is that, uh, is, is somebody developing a history closer to or perhaps further away from? Are they able to make use of uh, different kinds of sources? Um, some, including secondary sources, where you have multiple uh, contributors who've been developing analyses. And I know, uh, Dr. Murray will be able to share with us how important he feels history has been and, uh, and continue. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you actually about this, Dr. Murray, uh, your ongoing uh, uh, connections, I believe, to a society for history of medicine. And uh, so uh, we can hear more about that as well. And certainly Dr. Murray was sharing with me uh, in, in some of our conversations leading up to this presentation, that um, students, no matter what uh, scholarly projects they might have been doing, were always encouraged to consider the history, the historical context uh, for the topic area they were studying. So uh, I'm gonna move forward here to give a little bit of a, there we are. Okay, so here I've got a bit of an overlay on, um... excuse me, I'm just gonna get a water. Uh, of some touchstones that we might consider and thinking about humanism, humanities in uh, medical education. Taking a very broad historical context, you can go back to, historic, uh, to classical antiquity. Um, and here we'll find uh, Hippocrates. Uh, this would be, and, and, and other uh, leads, uh, leaders or visionaries, um, eminent physicians and healers. Uh, I've got Zhang Zhang Jing here uh, from China, uh, who became known as the Chinese Hippocrates. But during this period, their knowledge of the body uh, was not certainly developed as we have understanding now. So those who were working as physicians <clears throat> were, were uh, used all of the information that they had available. They were concerned about the whole person, all aspects of the individual. And uh, <clears throat> you'll have, uh, there's a recognition of needing to care. Um, so Hippocrates, who wrote the treatise on the art of medicine is recorded as saying, wherever the art of medicine is loved, there is also a love of humanity. And that's often repeated. The Hippocratic Oath and its various adapted versions um, provides a reminder to consider the importance of recognizing always that there is an art to medicine as well as a science, and that warmth and empathy, keen insights and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or prescriptions. Zhang, who I mentioned, was an eminent early Chinese physician. He closely attended to his patients' physical signs and symptoms as well as outcomes obtained from the medications and drugs that he prescribed, herbs, et cetera. He stood for dignity and responsibility of the medical profession, which coupled with his close powers of observation led him to become known as the Chinese Hippocrates. Following the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, that this is what marked the beginning of the Middle Ages. And depending where you lived in the world, you, there were people experienced better or worse circumstances. In Europe, this is sometimes referred to as the Dark Ages, in part because of the great um, uh, 
a level of conflict that was in place uh, given unstable governmental sort of structures, again, following the fall of the Roman Empire. And so that led to uh, the early middle, middle Ages, the high middle and the late Middle Ages. The late Middle Ages was, is, uh, some, is when the Renaissance occurred. So it would be more in the late, uh, the high middle near the end of that, that something known as uh, the Black Death or the bubonic plague occurred in which half, it is estimated half or more of the population uh, was died. And the efforts of uh, the church that was a great power at that time, the efforts of the physicians laid bare the difficulties in terms of their understanding. Um, and certainly after this, where people used to just want in the, in the early part of the Middle Ages were satisfied just to eat and continue living. Following this, when there was more of a distribution, redistribution of power and opportunities, because so many people had died, and so those there's much more left for those who are left. The hope they became inspired to believe that something had to be better, that they could imagine something better. They went back to the classical texts that had that Hippocrates and other uh, early physicians had been writing, describing. Um, and believed there going back into antiquity would be helpful. And they really revered and, and respected those, but they came to appreciate there were limits to that. And they didn't just have to stay bound to early understanding and wisdom that could develop beyond that. That led to the scientific revolution, what is known as a scientific revolution and, uh, and new approaches and methods that went beyond those that had been developed earlier. Um, this led to many significant advances uh, that uh, people came to appreciate um, were really, really helpful in, in leading to different kinds of cures um, and uh, advances that were helping to progress life and help to heal people. So there's a big emphasis on science uh, and scientific advances that came out of this. And here you can see the, the Royal Society of London, there was a similar society in Paris occurred around that time where people are sharing their information, uh, their publications, et cetera. And this again is helping to advance things. The public, the printing press that was uh, invented or, or finally evolved from other innovations that had been developed and created before that uh, helped again to uh, promote this availability of knowledge, increased education, et cetera, all of this helped. Ultimately, you can see that um, as people moved through the modern period, uh, this, this led to the modern period, uh, again, advances of all kinds. And we can see here, um, it, we would be currently noted as being in the contemporary period, uh, which doesn't, you don't see this, but it's just after the modern period. Um, some you continue having significant uh, uh, discoveries, um, technological advances occurring through this period. The industrial industrial revolution occurred. Uh, a secondary, the second industrial revolution, uh, which was in the late 1800s, is also referred to as the technological revolution, um, and that has exponentially led to all sorts of uh, expanded technologies, including the internet, et cetera, which has led us into now what is known as the information age. And you can imagine all of these expanding opportunities for science and medicine, not always in the direction of compassionate care, um, believing just if we know what we need to know to, to help a patient, that's all that's needed and invest our time there. But people like William Osler uh, who is the Canadian physician and then went to St. John's Hopkins and then to Oxford, uh, always did not a, always uh, emphasized the importance of maintaining a connection to humanity and the patient. Um, Abraham Fletzner uh, is a leading, uh, leading uh, in this history or a, a, a figure in this history that's important, who is important. Uh, that we'll hear more about him from uh, Dr. Uh, Murray, and as well, we'll hear more about Dr. Pellegrino. Um, so I'll, I'll just mention their names at this point. 
but pointing again, we're now in an age of robotics in medicine, cloning and all sorts of um, aspects that are, uh, or artificial intelligence and on and on that are influencing our <clears throat> opportunities and, uh, and, and perhaps things we also need to be concerned about and need to think through carefully and seriously. So I think I am, <clears throat> I just wanted to give that broad swath, historical swath, see where we are. So here, just to share medical humanities, just as our notion of who we are as human beings has probably evolved over the course of time, from periods when we didn't even have mirrors to see our reflection, and now we do. And what does that mean about how we experience ourselves and experience others? Um, medical humanities, I think, has emerged as a term and evolved over time. Um, well, there's no clear definition. Um, you can see the, the wide breadth and scope of it here uh, that includes all of these areas, all offering perspectives that are helpful for us uh, to help to support, to practice humane healthcare. So I'll just leave this here for a second. You can take that in. How all can help to provide insight in the human conditioning, suffering, personhood, and a responsibility to each other. I think this is really a lovely, um, often quoted uh, definition from New York University's uh, Medical Humanities website. Traditionally, uh, medical humanities was considered in, in early on uh, in terms of history of medicine. Uh, law and ethics were important. Ethics particularly coming, uh, following from, <clears throat> with the, the contemporary era be, is noted as beginning in the 19, 1945 after the Second World War. And, uh, and all that we learned about the devastating uh, suffering and uh, that we can inflict one upon the other, uh, certainly in medicine, ethics became prominent. Literature also uh, emerged as an approach to understanding patients and their stories. Uh, that was in the late 60s, early 70s, I believe. But again, going back to the previous slide, uh, we're appreciating that arts, humanities, and social sciences and all their varied aspects uh, can provide a prism for reflecting and appreciating multiple dimensions of health, illness and healthcare across all health professions. And that brings us to health humanities, which is the term that's mostly used now. Locating medical health humanities. You can, medical health humanities occurs within medicine and that's where we are right now. Uh, that there are the different presentations, I believe primarily consider it from that vantage point, but certainly there are medical humanities scholars who are studying medicine and healthcare from outside of medicine, uh, say within departments of literature, film studies, cultural studies, um, on and on, history, et cetera. So, but we also have helpful both and and across interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary collaborative ventures, which helps to bring lots of uh, multi perspectival uh, appreciation. Um, so, go forward. And with that backdrop, I will pass it over to Dr. Jock Murray. And so, we will slip out of my slides and we'll go over to your slides, Dr. Murray. Thank you. And I'll come thank back. You. Thank you very much, Pam. And it's a great pleasure to oh. be involved in this conference. Well, as I say, it's a great pleasure. I'm just delighted that you're having this weekend to discuss a, an important project like this. And we might ask the question about why we should talk about the medical humanities. But medical humanities have always been an integral part of medicine. So unlike C.P. Snow, who said there were two solitudes and they would never come together, the sciences and the humanities. In medicine, the humanities have always been part of medicine. The question for us on this weekend, I think, is to discuss how well we incorporate that within medical education and in the lives and practice of physicians. Now, Eric Cassell 
wrote an important book on suffering. And I would, even though it's in the definition of the humanities that uh, Pam just mentioned, I would suggest that prior to Eric Cassell's writing his book on suffering um, some years ago, it would be difficult to find the word suffering in any medical textbook because medical textbook didn't talk about aspects that we're going to be talking about this weekend. They talk mostly about the sciences. But he pointed out that a person is not just uh, a body with organs and diseases. A person has a personality and a character. They have a past. They have a cultural background. They have a number of roles that they play in their families, their communities, their society. They have an existence in relation to other people. They have a political being, how they make things and negotiate things in their lives. They do have a body, and that's where medicine historically has concentrated. But they also have a secret life. They have a perceived future. You know, I took care of MS patients most of my career. The thing that affected most of them most deeply when they de developed multiple sclerosis was not the effect on their bodies. It was the effect on their perceived future. They're young and it changed their whole concept of their life. We all have a life of spirit. A threat, Cassell pointed out, a threat to any of these caused suffering not just to the body where we have tended in medical education to focus. And Eric Cassell, an intern, has died not long ago. A scientific education makes you better aware of science, but a liberal education and the humanities makes you aware of the complex and gives you an affection for the human condition. So our issue is really about since the humanities and the sciences do come together in medicine, how do we incorporate that better into medical education? And that's been a longstanding debate. Prior to the 19th century, there was always the concept of the learned physician. The physician and his education was very broad, as and Pam mentioned, even back to Hippocrates, that was the concept of a broadly educated physician. The change that occurred in medical education was really related to Abraham Flexner. Now, Flexner did some very important things, and he did not mean to de-emphasize the humanities. He felt that the humanities should come prior to the medical education, and he wanted to improve the sciences that were developing, particularly in Germany at the time. And he changed medical education towards a heavy concentration on laboratory medicine and the sciences. He later, in fact, was concerned about the de-emphasis, not only in medicine, but in the universities about the humanities. Now, I graduated before most of your parents were born. I, I entered medical school in 1958, graduated in 1963, and I had what I thought, and I think it, it was correct, that I had a very good medical education of the time. But looking back, and these are my notes from my third year, which I still have, I noticed in looking at my notes from my medical education, there was no teaching of ethics. There was no reference to medical economics. There was no teaching about sexuality. There was little attention to communication skills. There was little teaching of clinical skills and technology. Clinical training was always just in the major big city teaching hospitals, not in community hospitals, not in relation to the community. There was no community experience in my uh, education. There was no training for office practice. There was no discussion of collaboration with other health professionals. There was no discussion of professionalism. Now, it's not that they didn't want the graduates at the time not to have this knowledge and experience and skill. They just took it for granted. They thought, that's important, but you'll learn it. You'll pick it up. They wanted it, 
but they took it for granted. And I think that's no longer um, reasonable. We want our physicians to be broadly educated, clinically ethical, humanistic, caring, and aware of human values, the human condition, sensitive to cultural and sexual differences, and balanced in their lives and their emotionally and that they're emotionally stable. Medical education should focus on these just as they do for the sciences. We should not just take it for granted that students will turn out to be humanistic physicians. CanMeds has gone some way, but not far enough to broaden the concept because my medical education was primarily about being a medical expert. These other aspects were all taken for granted. There are other things, however, that I think we have to broaden that concept of CanMeds further in the future. Now, it's interesting to look back about how people then began to get serious about the fact that medical humanities should be incorporated within medical education. Um, Penn State University at Hershey in 1968 developed the first uh, medical humanities program. Pellegrino and others really became the philosophers and the advocates for serious attention to the medical humanities. Nin by 1974, there were 40 so-called programs in medical humanities in American medical schools, and 1984, there were four departments. After that, there was a waning of many of these departments. Many of them uh, failed or transformed into other uh, other programs. Now, in the 90s, 1990s, I wrote to every medical school in the United States and Canada about activities in the area of the medical humanities. And one of the things I noticed is that the reason that many of the programs, which started with very good intentions, failed, is that they tended not to recognize the broad concept of the humanities. They tended often to focus on whatever was the interest of the person they appointed to head it. If it was an ethicist, eventually it became an ethics uh, program. If it was a historian, it became a history program. The important thing is to recognize the broad concept of the humanities uh, to make an effective program. Now, one of the things I noticed when we started the program at Dalhousie is that many of the components in our medical school and in every other medical school are already there. There are people interested in medical history, people interested in ethics, people interested in philosophy related to medicine, history, anthropology. You'll find these people in, in your university and your medical school. It's a matter of getting them together, coordinating and having them talk. That's the first step, I think. Now, Pam asked, me to address some of the things about why there's so many challenges to incorporating what most people think is important. Most people now agree that medical humanities are an important concept. One of them is that there's a lowered emphasis of humanities in general education, whether it's in the lower schools and in the universities, but in society in general, there is less interest uh, in the concept of a liberal education and a, a broad sense of education. It's mostly an emphasis for training for jobs. Curriculum committees, when approached about the humanities, indicate that, well, that's nice, but we've got so many other problems to deal with in our um, medical education. They also say, well, it's hard to measure the importance of having the humanities, uh, because we can measure other aspects in medical education, but it's hard to measure the impact of the humanities. And they say we should use the methods of science to justify the humanities, which is interesting because the humanities are actually a counter, counterpoint for the sciences, but they want us to use the methods of science to justify the existence of the humanities. The other issue that's important, and I'll come back to this, is that the faculty, like myself, have gone through a traditional medical education. So it's not in our experience to have 
medical humanities as part of how we become a doctor. Faculty often have difficulty getting what, it, what the concept of medical humanities is and how they can, in fact, play a role in that. They often see that they have an important role in teaching their discipline, but they're not sure about how they incorporate humanities into that teaching. And as I mentioned earlier, the leaders of this process must value all aspects of the humanities. And here's the biggest blocker. It's the older person like myself who says, well, I got in, I didn't get medical humanities in my medical school and I turned out okay. So they're not necessarily convinced because they learned it on their own or they didn't. So my feeling, and I think this is really important, one of the reasons that many of the medical schools have had difficulty is that one of our first chores must be to teach the teachers. If we're ever going to have medical humanities incorporated well into the medical education of future physicians, then we have to teach the teachers how to be involved in. You can't just have a few people interested in the medical humanities leading this charge. We've got to start teaching the teachers how to incorporate this into their teaching. And there are lots of, of ways to do that. Pellegrino said that the development of compassionate humanistic physicians was not in the curriculum. It's in the teachers. But there are positive signs. This weekend, I think, is a really a good indication that things are progressing. There are new medical humanity societies, as Pam has pointed out. Medical schools are incorporating medical humanities. They're just struggling with how to do it. CanMeds is beginning to broaden the concept of, of education. Students tend to be very positive about humanities when they enter medical school. That's why the teachers, again, have to pick up on this. Integrative teaching is a real opportunity for the humanities. And interdisciplinary programs are also an opportunity to teach, the, teach medical humanities. And I think there is, and one of the positive things is both not in, only in medicine, but in the public, there's an increasing acceptance of the importance of humanities in the education of physicians. And I'll just end here, but with an old photograph. This is a, by Eugene Smith, a great photographer of uh, the, the war and post-war period. Um, this was in Life magazine way back in the 1960s. He did a photo essay on a physician. Now, what we'll see is that this physician going to see a patient in their family home had what the, what the public wanted. He had in his black bag the wonders of medical science. He was scientifically educated in a medical school, and in his bag now he had vaccines and antibiotics and the new psychotropic drugs. But also, he had on his house call humanistic skills. He cared for his patients. He was empathetic. He was ethical in his approach. He listened. And he heard their stories as well as their symptoms. He understood the values and the background of their family and their community and their cultures. And he listened to their stories. I think that's what they wanted in the 1960s. And I think that's what people today want in their physician, this combination of both the wonders of science and the skills of humanity. So thank you for inviting me. I'm really delighted and I'm going to be dropping into the discussions and the talks during the weekend uh, to see very interesting people talk about very interesting topics. Thank you very much. have an opportunity to have a bit of a back and forth and questions with Dr. Uh, Murray as well at the end of this session. Sorry, thank you. Yep. 
So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Murray, again. And uh, I'll just uh, continue on a little bit. I, I left you uh, a number of slides ago, uh, perhaps having a picture in your mind about a young woman uh, walking the hallway of the Sir John Tupper building, imagining the possibility of uh, being part of a medical humanities program. Yeah. And as it turned out, uh, I was scanning all the different arts and health um, programs and initiatives across Canada uh, regularly on the internet and uh, would continue to copy and paste information and note where things were happening. And uh, I noticed that there's a lot happening in Edmonton. At the time I was at the University of British Columbia, again, completing my interdisciplinary studies, arts and health degree. And um, there's a lot happening in, in Edmonton. My husband at the time was in Calgary. He had an opportunity of moving to Edmonton with his job with Health Canada or going to Vancouver or staying in Calgary. And together we discussed the possibilities and I imagined that Edmonton might be the best place because of the number of uh, arts and health programs here. The uh, Nina Haggerty uh, uh, Gallery, the McMullen Gallery here at the University of Alberta Hospital, Artists on the Wards, the iHuman, uh, Street Youth uh, Organization, uh, many, many more. And uh, so we came here and I was working in the Department of Family Medicine as a research associate part-time and happened to meet the, the department chair at the time. And uh, he wondered whether I had any interest in a faculty position. At the time, I guess there was a lot of money available to the universities, which is not the case right now. And, uh, and so he was going to talk to the Dean, Dean Tom Mary. And I said, I be, well, the kind of faculty position I'm interested in relates to arts, to medical humanities. He said, well, I'm not sure. We're looking at rural family medicine and I had a connection with that as well. At any rate, uh, he did meet with Dr. Uh, Tom Mary and Tom Mary, uh, Dr. Mary shared that he had invested the full complement of funding he had for, uh, for rural health. And, uh, but when he learned that I was interested in medical humanities, he said, I'd like to meet her. And I, I had a young child at the time and I asked my husband if he would take primary care of our son. And uh, I spent the next three weeks working hard on a program proposal that ended up being two binders worth of information. Uh, this is the one remaining binder I have of a two set. And I came forward with multiple copies for everybody that was going to be in the meeting. It wasn't a long meeting. And a decision was made to post a, dis a position description, which was competitive. So I, along with others, applied for it. And, uh, and when I later talked to Dean Mary about his, his enthusiasm for this area and that he was so willing to invest in this, uh, he shared it was because he was from Dalhousie and Dr. Tom Mayer, uh, sorry, Dr. Jock Murray had been his dean and he had witnessed the introduction of the medical humanities program there. And he said, I don't really fully, you know, wasn't super involved, but lots of people seem to really like it. And, uh, and I believe in it, he said. So it was so he supported it, and uh, and we started off. I uh, what I helped. I worked with Dr. Verna Yu um, in. We became the founding co-directors for the program, and everything was interesting. Everything that I had outlined in my program proposal, I don't think I opened it up once after we started because it wasn't about what I. I wanted to show that I could think programmatically uh, about a structure that could be helpful. There are a lot of needs assessments or environmental scans, et cetera. But I knew that I, the program needed to be part of the heartbeat of the faculty. It would be people that came to me that wanted to work together on something they'd like to see happen that I could help support. There would be, there'd be different things, speaker series, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But um, so that was 
that was just such an incredible opportunity. And I, I invite you all to consider the things that you feel really excited about helping to create or co-create with others. Um, I, I feel really blessed by, by this moment in my life and every moment since that I've been able to live this dream. I'll go forward a little bit. Um, medical health humanities, early on, there were those strong streams. There were people that were leading different initiatives and programs, some who questioned my, you know, who are you to do this? You're not a PhD in history, or you're not this, or you're not that. Uh, but ultimately, I felt better when I was meeting with people at different conferences in the UK and the US and recognizing that this was the movement, was to be more broad, as Dr. Murray had shared. That you, being one thing actually made you vulnerable. I came across uh, Stephen Patterson's uh, description or his, his vision uh, for a medical humanities that would be a loose coalition of concerns, people, disciplines, approaches, practices, and methods that are engaged in a fairly open-ended dialogue and exploration of where humanities approaches, et cetera, can be illuminative of or obstructive to health and healthcare. So that's, so he was lovely. Uh, that was helpful when I felt worried. Now, one thing to share about this story, um, and this expands out then, was Dr. Uh, Dean Mary wasn't our dean for a long time. He was dean for one term. And then he went back to Dalhousie and became dean there. So when you're funded on contingent funding by the dean who no longer is there, the next dean has his or her own passions, interests, visions, et cetera. So I felt started feeling a bit vulnerable. And this was a point in time when there were not, there was not a strong presence of medical humanities in Canada. So I recognized that it would be important to help develop the field, to say, it's not just me, it's a thing that's happening. And um, I approached uh, Dr. Marcel Dion, who at that time was at the University of Saskatchewan, um, and he was connected to the Canadian Association for Medical Education. And he told me about educational interest groups. And so together, we applied to create awesome, great acronym, which I enjoyed saying a lot, um, Arts and Humanities, Social Sciences and Medicine Educational Interest Group. And this would meet at the annual uh, Canadian Conference of Medical Education. Now, it was a loose gathering and very often I would schedule um, the meeting uh, and it would just be by word of mouth that people would end up coming. The first time that I went to after I'd scheduled the space in the conference and the room, et cetera, I wasn't sure if anybody would show up. And they did, and it continued on. Um, ultimately, uh, I met Alan Peterkin and uh, learned more about what he was doing. I was very lucky. We had uh, the Teaching and Learning Enhancement Fund that funded me, funded the program for $100,000 over three years. And that really helped us to get a lot of activities going um, and help to secure the program for that period of time, even after Dean Mary had left. Uh, and I was able to bring people in that I'd heard of, very similar to uh, how Manisha has reached out and developed her network, um, inviting people to come and speak. Alan Peterkin at the University of Toronto came and did a number of workshops and lectures while he visited. And we developed a, a, a a long-standing uh, professional and personal friendship uh, over this period of time. He tells a story of taking the brochure that I had for the program and putting it in his pocket and thinking to himself on his way home, I can do this at the University of Toronto, which he ended up doing and we'll show that. But he was the one and he's had incredible energy for building this field as well. Uh, I would invite him to different conferences I was going to and he gets so excited to say, we need to do this in Canada. And uh, and so ultimately, together, uh, his inspiration, we created, we organized the Creating Space for Arts and Humanities in the Education of Health Professionals, which became the Creating Space Conference that is ongoing right now. And we'll see a little bit about that. But Creating Space is a bit of a double entendre of there's no space in the curriculum for arts and humanities. It's kind of like, well, let's create some space <laughs> or just find it somewhere and continue on. 
Uh, so this is a wonderfully attended uh, conference. Uh, you can see that uh, all of the programs for the past conferences are available on the Canadian, conference, uh, Canadian Association for Health Humanities website. Uh, this is the program that Dr. Peterkin uh, uh, created, and he's gone on to create other certificate programs in narrative medicine and on and on. He's made many, many uh, contributions. Just recently at the Health Humanities Consortium, he received a Visionary Leader Award and well, well deserved. So my friend and colleague, Alan Peterkin. Um, oh, sorry, I guess I didn't take that off the previous one. At, uh, I wonder if I can go back, I can. Um, I think it was, so in 2018, um, we were in Halifax in the Tupper building. And that was where the first slate of um, uh, uh, leaders, I guess, uh, I know there's a better word, of uh, the, the president, vice president, um, communications and uh, finance leads for the association and the association itself were founded. And that was uh, an initiative of Alan's, myself and Barb Sibbald, who was the humanities editor at the Canadian Medical, uh, Medical Association Journal. There's an upcoming Creating Space meeting. Uh, just wanted to give a shout out. Um, now here we have, going back to, you're seeing some of the growth here in Canada. Uh, now, over time, as this is happening, increasingly there are different programs and initiatives that are growing as well. But I think it's important to go back to um, Tom, uh, Abraham Flexer report. That is a report that was based on his visit to medical, oh, sorry. That was a report that was based on his visits to all medical schools in Canada and uh, the United States. So his recommendations were based on what he viewed as current approaches to medical education. And his recommendations were applied to both Canadian and medical education um, uh, medical schools. But there's a, I feel a difference between how medical humanities has evolved in Canada and the United States. Um, we talked, there was the unintended consequences that Dr. Murray shared. Um, you know, we get blinded by the things that we just assume. What are, you know, we have assumptions that things are gonna continue on as they are, and we lose sight of those, and we get focused on the things we wanna change. And that's what happened for uh, Abraham Flexner. He, just, he believed that all medical students were gonna be coming in with a liberal arts education. He did not anticipate that his recommendation for a stronger uh, bio, uh, biomedical sciences foundation in years one and two would ultimately lead medical school applicants to do science degrees as their undergraduate. That was not what he anticipated. So that was an unintended consequence. But there were other unintended consequences that came out of this that I'll cover shortly. Um, here's uh, another timeline, historical emergence of the medical humanities in the West. So after the two world wars, uh, we had many efforts that were increasingly directed to international cooperation and aspirational goals for medicine and health. We have the World Health Organization that health should be complete, mental, uh, physical, spiritual, on and on health. I believe that was similar to after the bubonic plague and the Black Death, that the world needed to believe that we could do better for ourselves and for each other. Um, George Sarton uh, was a historian of medicine and he coined the term medical humanities in 1948 in an article um, that he published in the journal ISIS, I believe. Uh, Dr. Murray made reference to C.P. Snow and the two cultures. So people are starting to appreciate or they're able to see what are we doing? We're keeping these so separate and what are the possibilities for bringing arts and human um, humanities and science together? Now, Ludmurer is also a historian of medicine, and he wrote the text Time to Heal. And in that text, he, he uh, outlines how change in education and medical education over time um, has occurred in relation to societal forces. So there is a societal contract between the public and the profession of medicine and professionals. 
And when the public gets um, feels that it's not a good bargain that they're in, they'll, there's protest, et cetera. And it's not just protest. Often it's, it's very sensitive when it's directed to, to the medical profession, but societal protest itself also provide a context in the conditions for considering important kinds of changes. And we've seen that even in the past number of years in relation to racial injustice and social justice concerns, et cetera. So societal discontent and counterculture protests, uh, Ledmerer uh, suggested led to the impetus for educational reform that led to ethics, law, history, and literature in US medical schools. Um, in fact, a medical humanities initiative that we wouldn't even consider medical humanities now, and that's like sort of that history evolves and changes, but bringing standardized patients into medicine, medical education was considered medical humanities. And now we just consider that, of course, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, our, our hopes and expectations that the contributions have, have gone beyond that, and, and we're, we're con still continuing to, to desire more. The Society for Health and Human Values uh, was introduced in the 1970, which led to the uh, American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. And you can see journals, literature and medicine, Hastings Center Report, the Arnold B. Gold Foundation, uh, which is a leading um, foundation supporting lots of different inter interesting initiatives and educational opportunities through the 80s. I'm going to show you again another summary of everything that's happening in the Uni United States, but you have heard about what's happening in Canada through the previous slides. A few things that I wonder might also have influenced our history was that we had a doctor strike in 1986. The doctors went on strike. They were going, they were having um, uh, marches, uh, and this is in Ontario, uh, going to the parliament buildings because they were upset that the MPs weren't supporting their ability to extra bill. They felt that that was going to be a no brainer. People would completely appreciate all the wonderful work that they were all doing and that they should be paid extra for for being such wonderful physicians. They were surprised when the public did not support them in terms of extra billing. It was as if the public had shared, um, no, I really would actually, I'm, I have some dissatisfaction with the way that I'm being treated or I have more hopes for this, et cetera. The fact that, this, that patients did not support their, um, pro, uh, their uh, call for extra billing and neither did the government, led a number of educators back to the table to say, we seem not to have a good understanding. We need to, and perhaps the people just understood what our roles are and that we could communicate better all that we're doing well for patients. And of course, um, that was probably a part of it. This led ultimately, to, that led to the Educating Future Physicians of Ontario, which led to CanMeds. And for those who are familiar that's a role competency framework. And you can see this image here in which medical expert is at the center. So patients can feel very confident that all of these roles relate to being expert in medicine uh, and so in all the sciences, et cetera, as uh, Dr. Murray shared in his last photo, that you can feel confident about that, but also that you bring much more to those patient encounters. So you'll see professional communicator, collaborator, manager, scholar, and um, advocacy. It was around this time that the Medical Humanities Program at Dalhousie was introduced in 1992. CanMeds followed in 1996. Um, you can see more happening uh, in relation to the, both the US and Canada. So medical, 1992, other programs started in 1967 in the States. Um, the Arts and Humanities Health and Medicine Program started in 2006. Um, Around this time, the health, the humanities, arts, and health, uh, Dr. Alan Peterkin's program started in 2009. You can see in Manitoba that there's another program in 2019. The University of Ottawa has a division of medical humanities that was introduced in 2014 and on and on. But you can see a number of different, it's increasingly sort of occurring there. Um, but compared, I wonder what my next slide is going to be, compared to all of the initiatives in the States, and ours, 
I feel that there's been a lot more activity there than here. And I've wondered what the difference might have been or might be. Now, those calls, you can see in 1929, there was the uh, founding of the Institute of History of Medicine at Johns Hopkins. I'm not sure that it would be great to uh, outline our history over a longer period of time than we're currently aware of, but ours starts about 1992 with Dr. Murray's founding of the Medical Humanities Program at Dow. You can see all of this. In 2003, that was a special edition of the Academic Medicine Journal, dominated by USA Medical Schools, and on and on. And I bring this timeline, which is available on the Health Humanities Consortium, and it includes both Canada and the US, the UK and New Zealand, Australia, et cetera. But I've just had the US here. Uh, but Canada has less on it. I think we could populate it with more items. Um, and I'm sure they would welcome that. So very often in the literature, uh, surveys will be done of Canadian and American medical schools in relation to teaching medical humanities. And our percentage of medical schools that are a report that there are different kinds of teaching and contributions is much is much lower in comparison to the United States. Again, there's been a lot more activity for a lot longer. Why? I'm not sure. Um, but one one question I've had, not probably the only factor, but was whether can meds, whether that slowed the growth of the medical health humanities in Canada, or was it something else? So it's an open question. Uh, again, this is a. Uh, article about the um, roots of Canadian competency-based medical education. And of course, competency-based medical education means you need to be able to observe it. Did it happen? It's because you observe it. So it's a lot. Doesn't uh, involve capacities or capabilities, which may be more humanities focused. How does one observe or the, the question of measurement that uh, Dr. Murray uh, alluded to earlier, made mention of earlier, uh, makes medical humanities teaching more difficult to include in a way that you can rationalize it as you do competencies. So I've wondered, this is called the law of the instrument. Abraham Maslow, Maslow and others have been credited as saying, if you only have a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. So in terms of developing or helping to educate compassionate to physicians, Hand meds should do it. And a lot of money, a lot of resources, and justifiably proud are our, our Canadian uh, medical uh, educators over the past decades should be of, of the progress that's been made with can meds. But is that all we need? Could we do more? Medical humanities teaching at McCanadian Medical Schools has expanded. This is, uh, I believe, this is in 2000 and six or eight, um, and then this was repeated, the survey of Canadian medical schools a decade later, and incredible uh, growth in terms of reporting on medical humanities teaching. This is outside of medical programs. What has contributed to the growth of medical health humanities? I believe there has been increasing concern for social dimensions of health. This is through the efforts of the World Health Organization again. Uh, the definition that I alluded to before, uh, Engel's biopsychosocial model, and not just the medical mo model uh, of health, uh, social accountability, bringing, being in partnership with communities, policymakers, et cetera, requires different kinds of knowledge, not just biomedical scientific knowledge, and social determinants of health, appreciating that there are many factors contributing to a uh, patient's health, I believe has helped to open up the uh, social, uh, dimensions as well as psychological dimensions of health. Um, I'll just go forward. Now, interesting, if you look at the history of can meds early on, and Dr. Murray reviewed the early reports he shared with me, uh, where he actually saw originally what was meant to be at the center of this flower was physician as person. So that the development <laughs> of the physician was, would be accorded uh, uh, importance. Who is this person? Of course, you as a physician 
are an instrument yourself of healing. But I wonder if at that time, and Dr. Murray may have some comments, that it might have been felt that doctors were already wanting more money. It was you know, kind of following maybe the, the uh, counterculture generation and, I don't know, navel gazing or whatever that might have been concerned. Like, may, perhaps people felt that patients really, the public really wanted to ensure that their doctors were expert and also able to have these other aspects uh, of the pedals contribute to their care of them. But ultimately, as Ken Meds has been adopted by other countries in the world, here in the Netherlands, uh, they've included the stem, the reflector, which is meant to bring the person in. That physicians should re be reflective, um, always learning, et cetera, et cetera. So the missing person uh, it was an interesting thing to come across in terms of Ken Meds. Um, over time, reflecting this increasing concern about the physician uh, and development of character and being and et cetera, all of that that Dr. Murray had shared was just assumed, you'll just take care of that, that'll just come to you. Um, people began to recognize this is Miller's competency pyramid that people should would learn by knowing and then knowing how, and then if you could show and demonstrate that, and then you just do it, that's sort of how competency develops over time. The cruises at McGill, um, along with uh, Yvonne Steinart, uh, suggested the need to include identity, gaining greater confidence, being a physician or identity formation was important. And I think that again reflects that uh, appreciation of development of oneself as a caring physician. Um, so there we are, that's wondering about Ken Nets. I don't know. Uh, oh, doc, it's interesting, Dr. Vernon Yu, when, uh, here's a question. Why did I find Edmonton, I'd never lived here before, being perhaps one of the most optimal places to come that it might, and I didn't know that Dean Mary had, had Dr. Murray as his dean. I had no idea of that just on the basis of Edmonton and seeing all the different initiatives and programs, I felt this was a fertile place for this. There were already people that had awareness of this, but why Edmonton? And having moved here from Vancouver, it occurred to me, I think I know why. Like I used to be outdoors all the time in Vancouver and I'd look up to the mountains and I'd, I'd look down to the ocean and I would be filled by nature there. When I came here, I, went, I didn't know where to look. I'd look up and then I'd, I'd be shocked that I couldn't see the mountains that is quite flat. To recognize that you need to kind of look down uh, into the river valley to get that sense of very great landscape. Um, and I felt Edmonton known as Festival City because we need to create culture and meaning and, and significance of, of, of experiences, et cetera, here. So people understand the power of arts and culture for that in this location. In addition, I did. I, I would ask in the early days, um, Dr. Bernie Yu, why do you think that it's much slower to happen here in Canada, the medical humanities movement? And what she shared with me, she, she thought, but then you've got to look at this. Anyway, I'll say what it was, that we had more, can, we pride ourselves on our, so, on our model of socialized medicine, kind of pat ourselves on the back. In the States, they would have more pressures on that, and that um, perhaps is addressed more so by, uh, by medical humanities. So that's an interesting thing to think about. So I'll just, uh, so, so many things to think, to wonder about, to explore for future his, uh, historical uh, scholarly works. Oh, so I'm going to go back here, and this is Looking forward, the future of medical health humanities. I think that I wonder, this, I, and I'm interested in other people's contributions, thoughts, and ideas, but as I said before, I felt that there's a lot going on in terms of social justice, in terms of change in our, um, the, the environment in which we're working, and also assessment is an interesting thing, and I'll just share a little bit about that. Uh, but recognize as well, in terms of our, our the contemporary period and era, we have got ongoing conflict. Um, we're an in increasingly interdependent world. We do have more international uh, 
cooperative ventures, um, which are wonderful. We have in, in continuing on technological advan advances like genetic coding, robotics, and various things that are both helpful. Some of them are worrying that we need to address as well. Uh, we have our information revolution. Um, all of this engages ethics and medical health humanities. As well, we're concerned about our planetary health. So that might be something else I might add to this list. Um, but just going on here, um, interestingly, one of the unintended effects, and I've lost my notes, so I'll just try to go from memory. Uh, Abraham, the Abraham Flexner Award had been, for many years, the preeminent award given to an educator for distinguished service to medical education. And this was withdrawn in 2020. And the reason for this was that it was felt there that his writing, because he was a person of his time, had both was both racist and sexist in different ways. So he's just reflecting things that probably people wouldn't have turned their head around. But the other thing was that the result of his report caused many medical schools to close down. Primarily women's medical schools and also black medical schools. And that pushed the um, push back any advances or gains that could be made uh, in relation to those areas. Medical schools, I believe all of them had to be connected to a university at the time. And that's not how the women's medical schools or the black medical schools were primarily operating. So you then have in the late 1960s and early 70s, women, uh, collectively uh, agitating for more attention to women's health and women taking the, those concerns uh, through the Women's Health Collective, et cetera. And, uh, and now we see that we're, we're trying very hard now, uh, over a hundred years later to continue to do well in relation to uh, black health and, um, and racial diversity, et cetera. Here is something from a 2020, uh, history of assessment in medical education that looks at the future. And I know that we'll hear from many other people in terms of future scenarios or where they're seeing things are going, but they're suggesting, I thought this is fascinating, that gatherings that have considered where assessment will be in the future, those future scenarios suggest that health professionals will have to have different skills, abilities, and competencies, most likely in the humanistic domain so much else will be taken care of by robotics and technologies, but patients will still need someone who can partner with and enable them in navigating their illness and can help them make meaning of their situation. And obviously this would require yet a new rethink of assessment. Uh, this is a, a, a breaking paper that's coming out uh, that is in part uh, written by uh, our uh, Dr. Anna Oswald, who's here the University of Alberta that is explicitly looking at physician humanism in the next uh, iteration of CanMeds. And the history and of medical humanities in Canada, potential future directions, thank you. And I, I recognize we were started late and we're, I'm not quite sure where we are in our program, but I would like, if we have a few minutes, to ask Dr. Murray for his response or any thoughts that you have following. That was a terrific review of, of, the, Stop sharing. of the humanities. Um, I'd like to make one point that you raised, uh, my, the concern in CanMeds. Uh, I think CanMeds will evolve. Um, and as you point out, I was one of the early reviewers when it was started as EVPO. Uh, and I was concerned about dropping the term person um, because it did deal with a lot of things such as the mental health, the balance of life uh, and family and community. And we're now dealing with the issue of burnout um, in physicians. And th this idea of being concerned about the person of the physician was a very important component. They changed it to professional, which is a different concept entirely. So I hope that there will again be more attention to the, uh, the concept of person 
um, as we go forward. Thank you so much again. I want to, uh, if, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to clearly extend or share the story and how integral I feel you were to it. Uh, there have been, sometimes you do not know all how all of what you've done will be, will reach out in the world and what it will help to create. And um, I hope that, I'm so glad to share this part of my story that is so connected with you and what you've done at Dalhousie. And I know that it's not only uh, this, you have done so much in your life that has inspired so many, helped so many. And I just am so grateful and so feel so privileged to have this opportunity. And I thank uh, the Obliquity team, Anisha, Jacinta, everyone for this opportunity. It is just, it's just precious. Thank you so very much. I, I'd also add that um, I'm so pleased with the uh, contribution that Tom Mary made at um, at your university and, and in your personal experience. Uh, Tom will be attending our History of Medicine session on Monday night. So I'll give him your best wishes. He's a wonderful person and a very good friend. Uh, thank you so much. I do hope that his ears were burning throughout <laughs> this talk. <laughs> so warm best wishes and wonderful, wonderful thanks. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And uh, you can you're, please continue to stay connected to the presentations. Uh, it's really lovely to have you part of this. Thank you, Dr. Thank Murray. You.